All right. Uh, thank you for the beautiful music. We have participants here. I'm sure we'll have a few more trickle in, as has been our pattern. We're happy uh, that people can join when they can. Uh, Sheikh Lawit, uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third engagement of our Leading Towards Justice series. Uh, tonight, we are really happy to be joined by Dr. Robin Minthorn, Dr. Annalise, to talk about their new edited book, Unsettling Settler Colonial Education, The Transformational Indigenous Praxis Model. Uh, this monthly series will wrap up in June next month uh, with a follow-up to tonight's event. Uh, this series is co-sponsored by the Corbelli Fund, Leadership for Learning, Danforth, and the Just Ed Leadership Institute at the University of Washington's College of Ed. Uh, I am Anthony Craig, and I'm the director of the Leadership for Learning program. Uh, happy to hand over to my relative, Anne. Thank you, Dr. Craig. I'm Anne Ishimara. I'm Associate Professor of Educational Foundations Leadership and Policy and Director of the Just Ed Leadership Institute. We are super excited to be in space with all of you today to engage with uh, this powerful work and this new book. Um, this is a collective project that's been led and edited by Dr. Cornell P. Wardy, Robin Minthorn, and Annalise. And we're going to also hear from some of the authors today, um, Anthony Craig and Chelsea Craig. Um, and there's a whole host of other folks who've also been part of this project. Um, so we'll hear a little bit about um, uh, who some of those folks are and what some of this work is about. We're excited to dig into those um, ideas and some of the chapters in the book. Um, so the series is about leading towards justice, and to do so, we must always begin to begin by acknowledging that we're on Indigenous lands. At the UW, uh, we're on lands of the Duwamish and, and Coast Salish people, and those folks have stewarded these lands, waters, and lifeways since time immemorial, and they continue to do so. So even as we seek to reckon with the ongoing dynamics of settler colonialism, we're also looking to the leadership, to the wisdom to the the beauty um, and the thriving um, that um, we learn from indigenous elders, families, uh, tribes, and communities. We also want to name and recognize the labor of those who were enslaved from Africa, whose labor and contributions were really um, fundamental in building this country. And to figure out how do we move beyond these kinds of uh, performative acknowledgments to really lead in solidarity uh, with indigenous peoples and lands as well as black and other communities of color. Um, and and I, we'll, I will talk about this in a minute. I think we also just wanna acknowledge um, that um, there are some really major events that have been going on um, as well that we wanna hold. Thank you, Anne. I uh, wanna pick up on an idea about the performative nature of many uh, institutions and people's land acknowledgements. I myself am a citizen of the Yakama Nation. I'm a descendant of Puyallup and Suquamish Nations, and I live at and zooming in today from Stahobj territory, now known as the Tulalip tribes. When uh, the organizers of this event got together, we are um, explicitly committed to thinking about the ways our work can uh, build towards more just and sovereign futures, uh, starting with indigenous people, but certainly not stopping there. And so I alluded to, I, I think what a lot of us are, are grappling with this cumulative effect of uh, the grief, the anxiety, the, the fear, anger, fatigue uh, that so many uh, folks are, are experiencing, but especially uh, black communities and other communities of color. Uh, we're really devastated by the race, racist violence um, and the shootings in Buffalo, but also there have been some um, shootings in Asian communities uh, in Dallas and in California. Our hearts go out to the families and communities who are grieving the loss of their loved ones. I think that part of the challenge of leading towards justice means that we have to acknowledge, learn about, hold and reckon with these kinds of uh, traumatic injustices and the white supremacy. Uh, that enables it. Um, but we also need to center the victims and their lives and the lives that deserve to go on and to thrive. So uh, even though uh, I think so many of us are struggling with the heaviness of it all, that uh, that we um, are, we need to be answerable to, as Lee Patel says, to our ancestors, to our children, to our grandchildren, to hold on to a kind of critical radical hope um, and to recognize that so many of us are doing the work day to day of building a more peaceful, well, whole, just, and joyous world. Thank you. Um, just to leave a moment for that um, reality, I wanted to make another um, 
A couple of logistical notes before I invite in our relative Dana, who uh, will be facilitating uh, with me in June. We'll, we are recording this session. Um, we also have closed captioning available. So should you need that, look on your Zoom bar, uh, message Deborah or Charlene if that's not um, uh, clearly available to you. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat. We're hoping for a Q&A time at the end. So we encourage you to have uh, type comments, questions into the chat and um, we'll address what we can and hope to be engaged with you. So if you've been following along with us over the course of the year, you know that uh, we have these as paired engagements. And part of the idea of the, um, of the series is to connect national scholarship with local leadership across our different programs and across our, di our different geographies. So we have a different pair of leaders who are facilitating each of our sessions. And today we're really honored to have Dr. Anthony Craig who will be uh, co-facilitating uh, with Dana Arviso who is a PhD candidate and also the director of Unite Ed. Dana. Hello everyone, I'm Dana Arviso and I'm a member of the Navajo Nation. I'm also a doctoral student in our University of Washington College of Education and a staff member that works to build and strengthen the college community partnership work. I'm also a former early childhood educator in our tribe's family literacy program, an auntie to my nephew, Sean Dean, and a frequent collaborator in native education spaces here in the Pacific Northwest. I'll definitely be taking a larger role in our next session on Monday, June 6, when Anthony and I co-facilitate a thoughtful discussion of the book with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Um, now with all of that done and uh, looking to shape space for us here tonight, I wanna introduce relatives, Dr. Robin Minthorn, uh, who is a Kiowa citizen, descendant of the Apache, Umatilla, Nez Perce and Assiniboine nations. Uh, Robin, Robin is an associate professor at the University of Washington, Tacoma. She directs the doctoral program in ed leadership and is the Director of Indigenous Education Initiatives for their School of Education. Uh, she's a big deal. Uh, second is Dr. Anna Lees, another relative, a descendant of uh, Ottawa peoples. Uh, Anna is an Associate Professor at Western Washington University in Early Childhood Education. She situates much of her work and service in Indigenous communities. And I'll say as um, someone who lives in the Tulalip community, we are very fortunate that uh, Anna parts with our partners with our early learning centers here. Um, and now I'm honored to hand the virtual floor over to Dr. Lees and Dr. Minthorn. Thank you much, Anthony. Um, I'm, I'm pausing because I'm, I'm not remembering, Robin, which one of us is opening, but I'll maybe go ahead and introduce myself and then hand it over to you to share slides and get us started. Okay. Ani kena analyze indigenous cause waganaka singo dawa and dao mishkike and dodum, shibuigan michigan donjaba, manawa washington and doda. Hi everybody, I'm Annalise from the Little Traverse Bay Bands Vodawa Indians, Turtle Clan on my mom's side and Scottish and German on my dad's side. Um, I am originally from Sheboygan, Michigan and have lived here now on Coast Salish territories um, just south of Tulalip tribes in Everett for seven years now. Um, and as Anthony said, I am faculty in the early childhood program at Western, and I'll be talking um, a bit about that work today, um, as well as how we've come together for this project. So um, thank you, Anthony, for the warm introduction, and I will pass it to Dr. Mithorn. Yes, I'm Hande Onde, Papa Onde, Robin Zipthola Mithor named Kara. I'm a citizen of the Kaiwa tribe. <clears throat> as um, Dr. Craig mentioned, I'm also also a descendant um, of the Apache Nez Perce, um, Assiniboine and Umatilla tribes. I am situated on the Puyallup tribe, um, Puyallup tribal lands, and I want to acknowledge that um, I'm responsible to the Puyallup tribe as well as the surrounding tribal communities where I work and live and where my daughter goes to school. Um, so I want to acknowledge that as well. Um, I'm an associate professor, as was mentioned. Um, I've been here for three years in the Pacific Northwest. I was born in Pendleton, Oregon. Um, but I grew up in Oklahoma. Uh, my dad is um, enrolled in the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, as is our daughter. My husband, Gabe Minthorn, is a tribal liaison at UW Tacoma and is enrolled Yakima, but is also Umatilla and Nez Perce as well. 
Um, and so I want to also acknowledge him. My daughter, as I was mentioning, er, mentioning earlier, will be in the background. So if you hear a four-year-old, that's Roxy. So I want to acknowledge her presence as well. Um, she's here with us today. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Dr. Cornell Pee Wardy. Um, I know we may um, share a little bit more here in a minute, um, but I really just want to acknowledge um, Dr. Pee Wardy, who I've known um, honestly since I was a young a youth. Um, and so I want to acknowledge um, his presence in my life. Um, I am really grateful for him. He is Comanche and Kiowa, for those of you who are not familiar with him. Um, and he is an emeritus professor at Portland State University um, and is also um, currently now the vice chair of the Comanche tribe. Um, but also he has um, founded and created many spaces for many of us. And so I also want to acknowledge, um, he was one of the co-founders of the Comanche Nation College, which is the first tribal college in Oklahoma. Um, he also just received a Founders Award yesterday, um, where he received the Founders Award for helping to create the Comanche Academy, which is a tribally focused um, education um, place in Lawton, Oklahoma, the southwest part of Oklahoma. So I want to acknowledge that as well. And for many of you who have maybe are from the Pacific Northwest, you probably have seen him at powwows, at gourd dances, and other spaces. So I also want to acknowledge um, his presence in that way. And um, and his role in indigenous education. And he's not here with us tonight. We're missing him, but we're also wanting to honor his spirit and his mentorship that he has had um, with us. And uh, before we go to the next slide, because I know we're gonna go into some overview, I do wanna acknowledge that this is the cover of our book. Um, and so um, this just came out in April. Um, so just last month. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the artist, um, Ryan Redcorn, who is Osage. Um, and so I want to make sure that we acknowledge Ryan, who is a part of conceptualizing um, how we would look at the transformational indigenous practice model in this book um, and really appreciate his creativity and his um, thought process and um, putting this together, but also making sure that it is uh, presentable, but also um, relatable for us. And so I want to acknowledge that as well. And I don't know, Anna, if you wanted to add anything else about that as well. No, I think that's lovely. Thank you, Robin, for doing that. I keep muting and unmuting, so I think I'm unmuted now. Um, okay, we're going to have time together today. Um, well, and in Chimiguach, Robin, for, for honoring Cornell and all that he's brought to this work, um, Cornell's been mentors to many of us. Um, and, and I think through this book, it really brings concretely um, so much, and, and I'll talk about the framework in a moment that he's conceived and guided us through, um, but I think the book also represents the, um, the extensive mentorship that Cornell has done throughout his kind of professional life um, and, and how he's brought all of us together, and, and I'll get to that a little bit more, but um, as Dr. Minthorne said, Dr. Priority can't be with us tonight, but his um, his presence and his spirit is, is with us as he's um, shared with so many of us um, and those of us that will be talking today. Um, so we'll open by offering um, some words from Dr. Priority to talk about the transformational indigenous praxis model and an overview of the book that I'll then go ahead and expand on a little bit. And then we're going to spend most of the session um, centering what we've called pathway making examples of how educators in a variety of contexts are working to enact research and praxis um, around the around this model. Um, and we'll we'll have representations of that from um, Anthony Craig and Chelsea Craig and the work that they've done. Um, myself, um, in collaboration with a good colleague, Dr. Veronica Velas, up at Western and preparing teachers, and then Dr. Minthorn will share her work as well. Thank you. So I will get into the video. Uh, I want to uh, make sure I'm sharing my sound so you all can hear this, but um, I'll go ahead and get into it now. <laughs> Hey <laughs> Hey 
But our way, Divinity Child. This is Cornell P. Rewardy. I'm here in Lawton, Oklahoma. I'd like to uh, give a shout out to the Comanche, Kiowa, and Apache uh, land acknowledgement for whose land we're, we're on and here in Southwest Oklahoma. Um, I'm a Comanche citizen, I'm vice chairman of the Comanche Nation and um, half Kiowa from the, uh, uh, from the Ecology family. And I just want to give um, a shout out to all those at the University of Washington who um, did uh, putting this project together. And I just like to briefly just give an overview of the model, uh, which we call the transformational indigenous praxis. Given that the United States educational system had been one of the most hostile and oppressive aspects of colonialism, I've tried to create a scaffolding structure that builds on the foundation of critical thinking as an intelligently subversive activity. In setting the parameters of critical thinking, I've designed a decolonizational model for helping educators indigenize their teaching and learning practice using Professor James Banks' multicultural framework for integrating diversity across the curriculum and infusing Professor Michael Yellowbird's decolonized stages of critical thinking. Hence, we introduced the transformational indigenous praxis model and as an in in innovative framework for promoting critical consciousness towards decolonization efforts among educators. The model features the concept of wave jumping to speed up educators' subtle energy learning together with a group of people or cohorts moving upward in their critical thinking and practice. With the concept of wave jumping, I'm exploring metaphorically how we can find a method for working in harmony with cohorts and clusters rather than working individually on our own, which is a Western concept. In retrospect, I'm thinking the interconnected teaching and learning, which empowers learners to respect and value others, to work, to learn, to play, to communicate and solve problems as a member of a group. This inner constructivist search for meaning is at the heart of interconnected education in which individuality is understood in the context of groupness and the whole is recognized as well as its parts. The beauty of putting wave jumping energy work to use is that we're reconstructing lost wisdom in modern times, but our way. So I'll expand here just a bit on, on what Cornell shared with us um, through through the visual. Um, and if if folks want um, a copy of this, I'm sure we can we can get that. Um, but what we've done, Cornell's been working on the transformational indigenous praxis model um, for decades, and I had the um, the the privilege of of developing this work into an article with him a number of years ago now. Um, where we tried to think how was all of this coming together in ways, as he mentioned in his recording, to scaffold teacher practice. Um, and we were thinking about teachers, and, and this has expanded out to educator, educators across contexts, and we'll be talking about that today. Um, but we really wanted to get at this complexity of being able to make forward momentum um, towards efforts of decolonization, increasing critical thinking, um, and also being realistic about how do we support each other in doing that in challenging contexts. And so, as Cornell mentioned, he really worked on this through, I mean, in real life practice of developing what he had named critical conscious study groups and bringing groups of us together to talk about our everyday experiences and help to continue building our thinking, um, building our theoretical framings, and the way we enact that in the everyday. And so what you can see here and what we've put together through this book is a model of wave jumping and thinking that um, he really stuck with this kind of notion um, that he was influenced living out in the Northwest when he was in Portland um, by thinking about water metaphor and thinking about how the rising tide raises all beings is what he, he kept pushing us for. So if we're all together, if we're collective, we can use that momentum um, 
for forward progression with and through the waves. Um, and with the me metaphor of, of wave jumping, we know there's also backwards resistance. Um, and so while we can build the forward momentum, um, we can also get pushed back as well. And that's where the collective really becomes essential to hold each other up in the process. And, and with this visual, we really wanted to show that this is cyclical and fluid. We're not putting forth a linear progression towards decolonization or a step-by-step -step manual, but a process to foster those commitments um, in ways that, that can be collective in nature. Um, and so you can see here, we have um, carved out four dimensions um, starting, and this is what Dr. Priority was mentioning, built from James Banks' original multicultural education framework. Um, we've renamed some of them, but following that same thinking that we can start with a contributions approach, move into additive transformation, and then towards what Cornell named the cultural and social justice action. And we'll be able to share a bit more about what that looks like in practice as we go through each of our respective chapters. Um, but wanting to think in all of these different contexts, how we can work with educators, um, ourselves included, regardless of where we fall on this continuum, to continue doing the good work um, needed to create the futures that we desire. In the next slide, Robin. And so you can see the book is organized into four sections. Um, and, and this came about naturally as, as we thought about balance and also thought about what's where are the different types of spaces that we're doing this work in education. So um, the book opens with birth to grade 12 and community-based education, then goes into teacher education, higher education, and closes with educational leadership um, that, that Dr. Minthorn will talk about today. Um, you can see here also the list of contributors. Um, it's a long list of contributors. And that was really intentional. I want to say that I don't have memorized, but I think we have 17 or 18 chapters in the book. Um, and, and we intentionally chose to have a wide range of representation um, while working with page constraints from publishing companies um, because we wanted a diversity of voices. We wanted to think, where does the TIPM take place in all these different settings um, and give as many examples as possible. We also really wanted these chapters to be accessible um, to all different kinds of readers. And so um, they are short. I think we have 3,000 words, if I remember correctly, um, and are meant to be written towards a practitioner audience. So we see it very much as useful in university settings. We also hope to find this in community-based organizations, tribal education departments. We really wanted it to have a wide reach. Um, and so that's, that's the reason for the structure. And I think if I remember the next slide, this will be passed over to um, Dr. Anthony Craig and Chelsea Craig. Thank you both. Uh, Chelsea and I wanted to start by uh, also situating our scholarship, our leadership, our work in, uh, into our families. So what we wrote about in our chapter doesn't represent all native people everywhere. It doesn't even represent all uh, Yakima people or all Tulalip people. This is Chelsea and me um, gathering ideas that our elders uh, have left for us and continue to pour into our lives and where we like to put our focus. Um, and they're not automatically transferable. Not anyone can just pick, pick up our ideas and apply them. However, uh, we see this as an important invitation for people to make sense of what uh, te what related teachings might be in their life? Uh, Chelsea, would you start us off? Uh, the next slide is good, Dr. Minthorn, the Hoyara Cha. One of the things, and we start our chapter off with um, really um, asking our reader to think um, very traditionally in our culture, um, in a traditional setting, if you were at a potlatch or a ceremony, there, there are teachings there for each and every one of you. And your teachings may be different. So you really have to be thinking with your full self when you're reading our chapter and we ask you to do that. And um, really listen to what the messages have for you because these are examples of when we had ears to hear, they guide us in our leadership, they guide us in our practice. So the first one is called Hoyara Chath. It's our way of life. And it's a teaching that came from 
my grandfather and and actually from an elder his buddy from um Swinomish, who was helping with a naming ceremony for our family and my grandfather it was in his very last year of life and he was frantically trying to um get this naming ceremony completed and he was feeling a little discouraged and this elder I remember um, I was able to witness it, sat right in front of my grandpa. And this is a picture of my grandpa here. And he looked right at him and he said, Hoyata we already have a way. And this, we already know a way. So that teaching, um, and that was later in my grandfather's life. And he, he practiced that in his life, but he needed that, con he was still learning at that elder, at the, at the end of his life. And we carry that teaching with us. So we do things in the best way we know we can because we always have had a way. Our people have been here since time immemorial. Um, the second little um, message came from my grandfather um, and it came from, from heaven. And um, again, we have when you have ears to hear, they, your ancestors still guide you. They're with us every day, guiding us in our work. And after a ceremony, the message came to me and he said, it only takes one spark to light a fire. He said, so get up. He cussed a little and said, get up and do something. And we take that to heart. Um, Anthony, you wanna speak more to that? Yeah, I, I wanna first of all say, Chelsea, I think we jumped in and didn't even say who you were and, and what you're <laughs> doing here. Uh, Chelsea and I were invited to write a chapter um, based on our experiences in public schools on Chelsea's reservation at Tulalip, where I had been working, um, worked for over 20 years in Tulalip as a Yakima person living there. So Chelsea, maybe uh, tell folks your name and what you do. Sorry. Well, my name is Squitalk. Um, my English name is Chelsea Craig. And um, I am the assistant principal at Colcita Tulalip Elementary. It's the only elementary school serving our people on the Tulalip um, homelands. And um, I have been an educator for 25 years serving my community in um, different, different jobs, including a librarian, um, teacher, and most recently a cultural specialist. And, and I'm working on my doctorate degree with um, the University of Washington L for L program. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. Uh, we're also a married couple. We have four kids and a grandson who are all Tulalip people. And our work started in the 1990s in Tulalip. And uh, Grandpa Bernie was our most important mentor, but we weren't conditioned to think of him that way. We were looking for mentorship within these Western systems. How should we run our classrooms? What's the classroom management strategy? How do we enact curriculum that's handed to us? And it was deeply frustrating. Uh, it felt harmful to us. The majority, vast majority of our kids were Coast Salish people, uh, mostly Tulalip tribal members. And grandpa would sit us down and say, well, you're choosing to do it that way. And that way meaning, you know, this westernized approach that had been um, enforced harmfully, violently on our people uh, throughout the generations. And we were participating in that. So the harm we were feeling within ourselves um, can be solved if we really work to enact Hoyadacha, our way of life. And uh, Grandpa would tell us, you already know enough to get started because we felt incomplete. The boarding school uh, robbed our family violently of our language, um, which we're now reclaiming, of our ceremonies, which we're now reclaiming, of our family structures, of education, like what it meant to be teachers, you know, to use the English word, we were doing it in a way that felt wrong. And grandpa said, yeah, that's because you're doing it wrong. So we've been on this journey of really um, not compromising anymore. And it, it can get really uh, challenging. So that wave jumping matters, the collective nature of TIPM and the way uh, Corn Cornell, like what a, I hope people recognize what a gift to have that elder sing us a song on that video to invite us into these really deep teachings. And we're just humbly trying to uh, connect what we have going to this, the brilliance of uh, Dr. P.B. Wardy. So uh, Robin, maybe we'll try to move more quickly now. Next slide. So 
uh, as Chelsea and I kept moving through, um, on the right hand side is a photo of uh, indigenous educators who are currently or uh, very recently at Colcita Telealp Elementary. On the left is um, many members of our family, not all of our children are there. Uh, we were trying to figure out like where does our work fit? Like we were meeting resistance, very clear resistance from places like the district. So, you know, many people in schools have this sense of hopelessness. They feel like, um, well, we can't do anything. Our hands are tied until we have a budget code or have a directive. And we just don't think of things that way. So going back to Hayaracha and our elder who says, you need to move like you're a member of a sovereign nation. So we do. Uh, we believe that everyone who is working toward the same um, sovereignty and self-determination of our community uh, are leaders. So this Lashutsi idea of dot dot suit, which means to be part of a solution, notice it's not to be the solution, it's not to enact the solution, but to work over time and work right now and not wait for anyone else to really uh, reclaim space and time and energy in our community. I, I loved hearing Cornell and then Anna talk about energy. Where do we put our energy? Anything here, Chelsea, or shall we move forward? Okay, Robin. Uh, two different ideas that we, Chelsea and I are working to weave together over time. The image you see here is done by um, Haik Stobj, uh, Jason Gobin, a Tulalip tribal member. This is his visual depiction of the changer story or lifting the sky. Uh, here, this, this has become an idea that as Chelsea and I travel and talk about it and many other Coast Salish people do as well, uh, people grab onto it and, oh, I, I would love to talk to my staff or to my community or to a colleague about this idea. And uh, we encourage people to, to slow down and go deeper. What does it mean to move within a community? Uh, the word on the right is from that story. Uh, this is a word, um, it's pronounced yahout. Yahout. When the people were um, first placed here by the creator and the creator sent Changer down um, and Changer quickly started to pass out languages. And he was in this part of the world and there are lots of languages and dialects spoken, you know, in the um, Salish Sea region, on the east side of the mountains, along the Columbia River, uh, along the coast, and uh, people couldn't communicate with each other. So when they had problems, it was hard to get the people all together. So um, a, a wise person came up with the word yahout. It became a common word across uh, territories that would tell people to proceed. In this particular story, the people were trying to work together to lift a sky. The sky was too low. Uh, there, was, there was not enough light. People couldn't move freely. And so they used the word yahout and successfully lifted the sky to where it is now. And the people um, found freedom. A related idea, uh, as I work to reclaim Ichishkin, uh, the language of my people, uh, which um, translates roughly into friends and relatives, but it's this idea of relationality and how in school systems uh, through leadership, we can develop networks of people uh, to use you know, English ideas to really decide what will it take for all of us to make contributions that can do th amazing things like lift the sky or lead toward justice. Chelsea? Uh, the only other thing I wanna add is what does that mean to be a collective? What does it truly mean? What does it mean to decolonize our ideas around collective and being relatives? That's something that I'm working on in a public school system when we don't quite understand that. But being a collective means no matter what, you always come up loving one another. Hmm. We might not like each other all the time, but we love one another. And more importantly, we know what we're working towards. We love our children. So our role, I might be the assistant principal, but I might need to go out and help in another relative's area because they need my assistance because our kids need that. So really understanding how to lift each other, how to, um, to recognize that we all are leaders working towards the same thing, no matter we break down the hierarchy of a, colony, a settler system. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. I'll, I'll add quickly that in 
the work that I'm up to at the University of Washington with um, my relative professor, professor Ishimaru, we're really looking to um, both disrupt, press pause on Western notions of leadership that really value and uh, put forward an individual. We know that individual is usually uh, a white man in this settler system and, or people who can uh, work towards the proximity to white maleness. And it uh, was soothing and encouraging to hear uh, Dr. Cornell remind us that those are Western notions of individuality. We are much more likely to be successful if we figure out how to be related to each other and how to understand what it is we're up to. So uh, we don't have it all figured out, but uh, if you were to walk into a class with Anne and me, those are the sorts of things you'd hear us talking about. And our last slide, Robin. Uh, this is both my favorite idea um, currently and also one that can be very challenging to be Native people, Indigenous people in these Western systems. Spiliai Witasha. So uh, the, the images here in the background is our most sacred site on, in our homelands, Yakima Territory. In English, it's Mount Adams. Uh, we know it as Patu. It's a photo by my younger brother, uh, Ryan Craig. And the image um, of the coyote or spiliae uh, in our language um, of, of the coyote, spiliae, is done by a Yakima Kunal artist, Haley Strom. Um, spiliae is a central figure in our stories and how we came to be as Yakima people or uh, people along Inchiwana, now known as Columbia River. And he showed us how the world works. And he showed us the expectations for how to be, how not to be, and uh, around the time of Representative Lewis's passing, uh, you know, he, he was famous for encouraging us to find good trouble, get into good mischief. My mom and I were studying the language together and we came across this word we had never heard before, had never heard anyone use, but our uh, eldest elder, Tuchamshish, who wrote the dictionary, included this word, tasha. let's get into mischief. So it's this collective idea of how to move in a world that may or may not be made for you. So we're reminded that our peoples are, are innovative and always will be, that these systems are temporary and we can work within them now in order to enact and replace them with systems that make sense for us as native people and we can be strategic. So it's both my favorite idea and the riskiest when people be, can see us coming. So it's hard to enact spilei witasha if people expect us <laughs> to be tricky. So this, uh, we related to ideas of fugitive pedagogy that come out of black scholarship, but just this idea of uh, what you see may not be exactly what we're up to and uh, moves that we make might not be um, easily interpreted. So I'll pass to Chelsea and then Dr. Minthorn, we are good. Just one, one critical piece about that is we have to be able to lift the fog of colonialism. Any air that touches this, our school systems is reeked in that, in that fog. So how do we lift that enough, lift that sky enough to be able to dream? We have to be able to dream. And sometimes our staff will, um, if we're having a hard time in, this, uh, in our school system, we'll, we'll need to go out to nature to be able to dream. So find, find the place where you can dream. Thank you, Robin, back to you and Anna. Chimiigwech, Anthony and Chelsea. There's a couple of things I wanna say before I get started um, with what I'll share from this chapter. One is that the way this book was organized was intentional. Um, and so I'm gonna to wanna to talk about Anthony and Chelsea's chapter a moment, um, but just to say the, the first chapter um, by our colleague Geneva Basente talked about indigenous languages. Um, and, and we started with that on purpose, um, that if we're going to, to engage the transformational indigenous praxis model, um, we must engage our languages. Um, and, and then followed by Anthony and Chelsea's work. Um, and, and I hope you all on this, on this call read this chapter that they've shared. It is, it's so incredibly beautiful and such a representation of what it means to do story work 
um, in the stories that they share in the chapter in in connecting so concretely and you'll you hear me say that word all the time because I get really excited when we can make things tangible in work of education and take these beautiful theories and in Anthony and Chelsea's case these beautiful sacred stories from their life that they share in the book and show what it looks like to do that with teachers with kids in schools um, for indigenous people and in within indigenous life ways um, and so I want to say that that's the first section of the book is really intentionally opening with this um, and and starting with indigenous values, knowledges, and ways of being. Um, it's important for me to say that because I'm moving us into the second section um, and I don't open the chapter that way. Um, and it's something that I had to think about in this book. It's it's something that um, my good friend and sister and mentor, Dr. Megan Bang has helped me think really intentionally about how we, how we can think about our writing not starting with the deficit not always starting with settler colonialism, but but beginning with with the world as we want it to be and, and with with what we know from our communities um, and then getting into to disrupting the colonial fog, as Chelsea says, I, I love that. Um, but for for this chapter, I relied on my my colleagues and relatives who opened the book for us um, with indigenous knowledges and ways of being. And I jumped right in um, with my colleague, Dr. Veronica Vela's um, to recognize clearly where settler colonial is, where settler colonialism is in early childhood education as a field and in, in the preparation of teachers. Um, and, and Vero and I have done, done work on this before of really making clear um, that, that standardization and, and what folks are writing about around neoliberalism and education are not new things. Um, but that settler colonialism and schools that have resulted from that have always worked towards standardization. Um, and, I, and we started to list like different ways that's coming about in early learning um, that started with boarding schools, that started by separating children from families, um, that became in what we see today as licensing guidelines and food regulations and sleep regulations and all these ways that children and families are controlled by the state um, that make the kind of work that we want to do in schools um, and in teacher preparation difficult. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Robin. Um, and so we started with that recognition and then thinking with the TIPM, how can we work to disrupt this in teacher education? Um, and Dr. Velas and I, when we, when we both came to Western at like just within a year or so from each other, um, and we ended up being able to partner across our programs. Um, I'm the current director of the Early Childhood Education Program at Western, and at that time, Vera was the director of the Education for Social Justice minor, um, and we were able to integrate the ESJ minor into our Early Childhood Education Program, um, and by doing that, we, we researched that work and examined um, with interviews from students that I'll share a little bit from today, what were the structures um, and what, what were the structures that we created and are coming together across programs to rethink what preparing early childhood teachers can be? And then what was the impact um, on those beginning teachers? And, and the teacher data that we'll share today intentionally looked at, um, at black, indigenous and other students of color that were in the program. It's a small sample size, um, but one that we thought was important to know how are we impacting these beginning teachers. Um, and so to do this, we have four kind of areas that, that we've identified as significant in the program, focused on building structures of relationality, engaging decolonizing and critical theories, um, embedding community partnerships and grounding work with children and in inquiry. And that's all kind of um, related to or hopefully working within a framework of land education. If you can go to the next slide, please, Robin. Oh, one back. There we go. Um, and to say our teacher education program is still mostly inside. So I want to put that out there. I think it's really important when we talk about land education um, that, that to do that right, we should be outside. Um, and we're doing some of this in the program. I'm teaching one outdoor literacy class and our preschool internship experience has a lot of outdoors. So we're trying, um, but, but both theoretically and in practice, we're working with beginning teachers um, for them to really, and I'll talk about this through different aspects of the program, 
um, but to recognize lands as indigenous and and to to recognize respect and come to consider indigenous knowledges as um, an important place of beginning as we think about designing curriculum with children. On the next slide, please, Reverend. Um, okay, so digging into what we found, and I'll talk a bit about how this connects with the transformational indigenous praxis model. Um, but we we talked in the in the chapter about ways that relationality was structured within the design of the program. And that was both relationship with place, um, Vero and I's relationship with each other, as well as students' relationships with each other, faculty and staff. And so our program is a cohort program. And it's one of the things that made it possible to embed the ESJ minor within the teacher certificate program, um, because we have a planned sequence of study and, and we can build that continuum of learning. Um, and it's also something that came up in the data all the time. And so you can see from the student who talked about um, starting to a university is really overwhelming. And, and for this student, she said she'd always counted on having close relationships with her teachers. And so having the cohort is really helpful because we're all doing the same thing. And I think about this with what Cornell talks about of needing to build that collective um, in riding those waves together. And we see that with students in the program that because they're a cohort doing the same thing, they're making that forward momentum together. Um, and you'll be able to see on some of these next slides how I believe that because of that and what we've seen in the data, because they have that secure community um, with a set of peers in the program and with faculty that follow along with them, they're able to take those risks in their thinking. Um, they're able to, to push their, their conceptions of what it means to teach young children further along because they have that safe environment to be building that criticality. Can you go to the next slide, please, Robin? Um, and so then in the embedding of the ESJ minor into the ECE program, um, the ECE faculty who built this program at Western were wonderful, wonderful faculty um, that had done lots around learning with nature and, and play-based curriculum and in recognition of community knowledges. Um, and so we had a really wonderful foundation of curriculum to work with. Um, and we're able to enhance it by thinking intentionally about where do we want to integrate decolonizing and critical theories throughout the continuum. Um, and this is a way connect, very much connected to our efforts of wanting beginning teachers to think about land education and what it means to teach in and with land, water, and place um, as, as the curricular beginning. Um, and you can see this, um, this beginning teacher saying that before taking these classes in general, they didn't think too much about indigenous perspectives. Um, and, and she goes on to say that this that as she's as she's doing this and, and learning, it reminded her that change is necessary as we learn more. And we can't just be stuck in that same method of like learning and teaching all the time. We need to adapt and be sure we're fitting the needs of our students. And so seeing a beginning teacher talking about the cyclical nature of developing curriculum with young children um, is really exciting to me. And this is in, in the chapter you'd see, we mapped this teacher development onto the TIPM continuum. So we can see what, what we analyzed for this candidate to be at this moment in time at the transformation approach. Um, and part of what we felt thought was really important in doing this work was showing this, this representation across the TIPM um, that, that we're not looking for this framework as just an analytical tour to or an analytical tool to see where teachers are in one moment in time, but really wanting to see the continuum so that we can learn how are we scaffolding teacher development across the framework and not seeing um, seeing their enactment as static or or stagnant in that way. If you can go to the next slide, please, Robin. And so because of that, you'll see here we I intentionally um, building for this presentation wanted to show different examples. And so we'll see this student here um, enacting an additive approach where she's still just starting to think about community partnerships. Um, my research beginning with, with my doctoral studies has really been interested in how do we set the conditions for community leaders to, to participate as, as teacher educators? How do we open the space to have voices from community to, to inform how teachers need to be serving our children. Um, it, it was something that, that I didn't get in my teacher preparation. Um, and I found 
find it really important and, and one that we have a lot more work to do. Um, but we're lucky in our program to be able to um, have a lot of community partnerships that help us know how to best prepare teachers. Um, and, and we can see some impact of that with the student um, at a beginning level. Um, but nonetheless, she's talking about this notion of intentionality um, and how she wants to be really thoughtful in, in things like setting expectations for students um, and being aware of who students are and what's the community that I'm reaching and, and just stating that that's important. Um, and so, so she's thinking about adding in some connections from community, um, but at that beginning level of recognizing that um, everything kids need to know isn't within a school-based curriculum, but knowing where they're situated and where they're coming from is an important beginning place. On the next slide, please, Robin. Um, and then I think this was the, the last section that we, we, um, that we kind of carved out for the structure of our program and just named it inquiry. And, and we could have a long conversation of all that's included in that, but, but wanting opportunities for beginning teachers to engage inquiry-based education um, and curriculum with kids. And they do this primarily um, through the program, but then they really have a capstone project in their preschool internship where they do um, small inquiry projects with a small group of children. Um, and most of them do something outside and, and they, they focus on children's relationships and understandings um, with and, and about the natural world. And so you can see the student that we've named um, at the social justice action approach and maybe not by, by taking action, but, but believing in action as part of early learning. Um, and I'll read this one. She says, I think it's important to acknowledge the land and water around us. And this curriculum can start a discussion that leads into bigger and more and important issues. And she's talking about work that she did with the tribal sovereignty curriculum in her primary internship here, um, where she says important issues that may be controversies about reservations or conflicts in government, social relationships with different groups of people, et cetera. Even though my students are seven or eight years old, they have the capability to start talking about complex problems and being a part of community that supports activism. Um, and so that was these, we had that we could go on and on with the data, but really to me, exciting um, thoughts and, and commitments from beginning teachers um, that have, have gone through a program where we work to scaffold their critical thinking um, and their commitments towards more just futures um, and, and how they're seeing that in their work with our youngest learners. Um, I think there's just one more slide, Robin. Yes, and so um, we don't have much of a conclusion in this chapter, but we do talk about to do this work, um, us as faculty also need continued faculty development. And so we share a little bit about work that Vero and I um, and our, our colleague, um, Dr. Dolores Calderon have done together on campus um, to continue thinking together and building our, our theoretical lens thinking about how are we working towards decolonial futures and doing that learning together um, to keep pushing ourselves to be able to do more. And so just emphasizing that our work um, as the researchers in the study, as the teachers in the program is very much unfinished and one that we're also, um, we're also trying to, to engage the TIPM in our own thinking um, to, to stay critical and build our consciousness. So Jimmy Gwetch, I'll pass it back to Robin. Thank you, Anna. <clears throat> so I'll start um, with my chapter, which was on uh, <clears throat> indigenizing doctoral programs, embodying an indigenous community ways of being. And so why I wanted to share these two pictures is I actually start opening with contextualizing who I am and where I'm from and who I'm connected to and who I'm responsible to. I also um, acknowledge in the chapter the ancestral knowledges. So when I talk about ancestral knowledges, I talk about the theoretical frameworks. And so I acknowledge story work as one of those. I also acknowledge the transformational indigenous practice model um, as a part of my um, ancestral knowledge. And then I also um, provide an overview of the genealogical um, <clears throat> uh, connections that we have. And so the literature that connects and where um, there has been literature on indigenous um, graduate programs or doctoral education and also wanting to acknowledge that as well. Um, but what I wanna um, start off with my sharing out with you all today is the creation stories. And 
I know for many of us um, who are indigenous or belong to tribes or connected to tribes, we all have our own creation stories. And um, Chelsea and Anthony were talking about a creation story right earlier. And so wanting to acknowledge our creation stories. And so when we talk about how we um, create programs or indigenized programs um, in ways that are very intentional. Um, and so on the right hand side on the screen, I want to acknowledge <clears throat> that I was previously, at, um, I was at, I'm at UW Tacoma, but previously I was at the University of New Mexico and I was there for seven years. And I want to acknowledge um, the University of New Mexico Native Leadership and Education doctoral cohort. And so this picture is a group of some beautiful, amazing leaders, um, educators who are doing some amazing work across Pueblo, Navajo, Apache communities um, in the Southwest part of the United States. Um, and they are working not only in school districts and tribal colleges, but also on their own tribes or Pueblo communities and want to acknowledge that as well. Um, but what I want to also acknowledge is that, that this is the, um, what came to be, this is from 2018. This is when our second cohort had started, um, but that our first cohort started in 2016 but that the actual work to collect the information from tribes and communities within the state of New Mexico took a two year process. And so what I want to acknowledge about that is that one many times when we talk about engaging with tribal communities and building these types of relationships and these types of programs, it doesn't happen overnight, right? It's not an overnight program, it's not an overnight opportunity. Um, when I was hired, I was hired because of my connection to indigenous leadership. And so I think the university thought, oh, she's gonna utilize like her research and her work to be able to build this, this, um, this program or this cohort. And so when I was started in 2012, I, I said, I wanted to do this with the community's input because I'm not from New Mexico. I acknowledge that I don't have the context that the tribes know. They know their communities, they know who they are, they know what they need for their communities. And so what I did is working with, I also want to acknowledge some, I had some doctoral students, I had undergrad students working with me um, over those two years to engage with local communities. And so we actually traveled across New Mexico to different tribes, to different pueblos, to Apache communities. And we also engaged with indigenous um, education sites. So like Native American Community Academy, the Institute for American Indian Arts, the Southwest Indian Polytechnic Institute, um, to be able to ask them, like, what do you want to see in a doctoral graduate or a doctoral recipient? What type of curriculum do you think is important for you? What are the outcomes you like to see? What, what would you like to share? I also asked, <clears throat> and I'll share a little bit more about that here in a minute, but I also asked them, if we could share a strength of your community or your education place, what would you share out? And would you be willing for us to come and visit you after this cohort is started? Um, and all of them said yes. And so we visited all of these places. Um, and so I want to acknowledge all of the students who are in this picture because some of them are now doctors um, and some of them are almost done with their doctoral degree and some of them are in the process. And so I want to acknowledge them as well. Um, and then on the left-hand side, I want to share um, about Muckleshoot. We have um, at UW Tacoma, we have a memorandum of agreement with the Muckleshoot tribe. Um, that was started, um, our MOA was signed in February 2020. Um, but before that MOA was signed, we started conversations in September of 2019. And over the time from September 2019 to February of 2020, there are almost 20 meetings that took place before that MOA was signed. I share that because it's really important for us to also acknowledge that it's not, again, an overnight thing. And even though that happened within like about six to seven months, it took many meetings and all of those meetings were held on Muckleshoot tribal lands. The only time that we asked Muckleshoot to come to our campus was once. Um, and so it's really important for us to also acknowledge that it's our responsibility as a university to go to tribes, to go to communities and to build those relationships and those connections. Um, and so we started our MOA in February of 2020. Um, and then we started our first cohort in the summer and June of 2020. We're now, our doctoral students in the Muckleshoot doctoral cohort are in there um, finishing their second year and um, they'll be starting their third year in this, this summer. But we also signed a second MOA for our second doctoral cohort, which will start next June of 2023. Um, but I also want to acknowledge the artwork because we also wanted to contextualize um, our partnership with the Muckleshoot tribe. And so, we had a call out to Muckleshoot tribal artists 
to create some a symbolism of what our partnership means and what it looks like. And so I want to acknowledge Samuel Obervap who created this artwork. The students voted on the different submissions that we had. Um, and this is the, the artwork that was chosen. This art, also this artwork had to go through university approval. So this is our approved logo and it took many iterations. So I also want to acknowledge that it's also going through like the system, right? But also acknowledging that we are also wanting to acknowledge that partnership. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that. And I also want to acknowledge because in some of another publication that I have a Dr. Denise Bill and Dr. Michelle Montgomery, um, we also share the creation story where we acknowledge Amy Maharaj, who was the first connector for this specific partnership. But we also acknowledge Dr. Virginia, or Virginia Cross um, and then Dr. Willard Bill, um, who some of you may be familiar with in the Muckleshoot community, um, who are well known around education, um, but that there were many, many people who helped get us to this place. And I also want to acknowledge them as well, because it's about us, them creating space so that we can be here. And so I just want to acknowledge that as well. Um, and so I'm not, I, I wanna make sure we have enough time. So I'm gonna stop myself at 545 so that we have time to go through our conclusion, but also have time for question and answers. Um, but I wanted to share some of the places and I won't go in again to too much um, detail, but uh, my next um, part of the chapter is on decolonizing approaches to academic programs. So again, I'm more like higher ed, but also educational leadership because I've worked in spaces in educational leadership um, in, here at UW Tacoma, but also at the University of New Mexico. Um, so one of my first questions, and I also, I pose all of my sections as questions because they're not always supposed to have answers, but there's also practice. So there's also examples of practice and how this is seen. Um, so how do we infuse the community consciousness in our academic programs? How are we acknowledging place and building land reflection into praxis? So for some of us, that might mean having a land acknowledgement in our syllabus. For some of us, it might mean actually having your doctoral classes on tribal lands um, and being able to like take the students to the tribal communities. Um, how are we responsible to and reciprocal with the community and acknowledging it's a, it's a two-way relationship and that we have a responsibility as universities and as academic programs. And I also want to acknowledge that this isn't just the indigenous faculty members responsibility to these relationships. It's all of our faculty's responsibilities to these relationships. Um, and it's also about us calling that responsibility to our faculty that work in our academic programs um, to be able to build these relationships, be knowledgeable about these relationships. Um, and it's really important that we also acknowledge like whose land we're on who are we occupying? Who are we responsible to? And how do we build sustainable relationships? And also, it's also important for us to acknowledge that there has been harm to tribal communities and that sometimes we come in and we may not have been a part of that harm, but we are also the ones that need to hear and learn from it and be able to do a better job. And it takes time for us to learn and grow. Um, and then the second, um, a uh, question is how do we include indigenous and tribal community input in our programs? So how are we including all voices and building connections across generations? So again, I was talking earlier about going to tribal communities in New Mexico and hearing about what they would like to see. Um, so I actually um, had meetings, I drove to uh, Muscalero Apache, which is about four hours away from Albuquerque to go and meet with uh, their tribal chair, tribal president. Um, also driving to the Acoma Pueblo and talking to not just their Pueblo, their governor, but talking to their education department, talking to different people. I'm talking to elders, talking to um, those that are younger that are working in the tribal community and hearing from them, but also how are we then listening and taking that in? And then how are we sharing it back? So one of the things that I did when I was meeting with the tribes is I took notes about all of these questions and then I put it all in this word document. And then we had a, a forum that we held at campus, but for those that weren't able to make it to campus, I mailed them a physical copy of their notes so that they would have that for them to own and have. So that whenever then we were able to then also build those connections to um, the communities, we were able, also able to go back and visit them. Um, also, what is the need and the strengths within the tribal nations and indigenous communities as again connected back to those opportunities, how do we engage and connect with tribes so one of the things i'll share 
as well with um, not only with the EDD program, but with our future partnerships that we're building with the Muckleshoot tribe is that there's a needs assessment that we're also sending out to tribal members. Thanks to Dr. Bill and to the Muckleshoot community, we we create the surveys in the School of Education, but then the, the surveys are then shared out by uh, Muckleshoot tribal members to go out to the Muckleshoot community. And then we look at what the survey results are, and then that's how we build on what we should create as far as our future partnerships are. So we're also encouraging tribal members to share their feedback and their input. Um, and again, I wanna also share about like building in the tribal community and our input in our programs is also about us like being responsible to sharing back out what's going on. And so one of the things um, with Nolly that I did at, at UNM was also shared like either by semester or definitely annually, I shared an update, a letter, and I sent it to all the tribal education departments. I shared it to all of the school districts that we had 23 high um, serving native uh, school districts. I sent it to all of those school districts. I sent it to the um, education entities I was talking about earlier um, because I wanted to make sure that they knew what was going on. But we also had um, a an advisory board for Nolly. And then also, I didn't get to mention yet also that we have a Muckleshoot Partnership Education Committee that Dr. Craig also sits on, um, that where we invite UW Native faculty and staff. And we also have Muckleshoot Tribal Council, Muckleshoot Tribal um, members who serve on that. And we meet on a quarterly basis because we wanna give updates on what we're doing, but also get, receive input on what we can do better and what we could be developing out. So again, and it's about that ability to build those relationships and to listen to the community. Um, and then how do we decolonize and indigenize our academic programs? So indigenizing our recruitment and admissions process. So for us, I'll just share for the Muckleshoot um, doctoral cohort, one of the things that we've done um, is we've incorporated them as in our decision-making process, in our sharing out process, um, and that they are also the ones that help us decide who is able to be admitted into our program. So if you talk about um, building those relationships, how are we building those relationships where it's a co-sharing a co and a reciprocal relationship? Um, honoring family in a ceremonial beginning. So um, when we started um, the Nolly cohort, I, um, I wanted to invite the students to invite their families. And I said, you can invite your families. We're gonna have this, this induction opening op opportunity um, at this event and um, on your first day is the orientation day. And the first, this was for the first cohort. Um, I, I didn't know how big that was gonna be. And I just said, invite your family. And I was like, I don't know what's gonna happen. Who's gonna invite their family and what's gonna, there were seven um, for, in the first cohort. And so when they came and their family started showing up, there was over 75 family members who attended that opening. And I thought that was really beautiful because it was intergenerational. We had grandparents there, we had parents there, we had children there, we had grandchildren there, we had brothers and sisters there, we had partners there. Um, and so we were able to acknowledge the students for them starting their doctoral journey, but we also were able to acknowledge the families for them being able to be a part of that journey as well. And then we continued to have semester connections where the family was invited on campus. We had potlucks and we we're able to acknowledge the family as a part of that journey. Um, and then for Muckleshoot, we were able to have a canoe journey song shared at the beginning as well as an opening prayer. Um, and then we also are planning now for our, our actual physically first in-person class in June. And I'm really excited because now we're starting to figure, think about like, what are we gonna do to make this something big? because this is the first time we're able to have our classes physically on tribal land. And how do we honor that? And how do we honor the ancestors that were there before us? Um, and then indigenizing our curriculum and our teachings, um, and then indigenizing the support and holistic approaches. And one of the things I'll just share um, that we do for the Muckleshoot cohort is we have a, co a group of us from the UWT side, as well as um, the Muckleshoot tribe side. And we meet at the end of each quarter how did this quarter go? What can we do better? What do we do better to support our students? And we're not perfect, but we're just always learning and wanna also listen to the students and we're always growing. And I think that's the also important thing is that we'll never be perfect, but we're always growing to support the students and that acknowledging, regardless if our students are doctoral level or undergraduate level, that they need our support and that we need to work together to be able to build those support mechanisms for them and with them. 
Um, and so one of the next parts of the chapter is calls for reciprocity and community building. Um, how are we including tribal indigenous communities in the strategic planning and visioning of our programs and of our curriculum? How are we making sure we're incorporating them, not as an afterthought, but as a beginning thought, as a starting thought? And how are we making sure that we're incorporating them in our voices and incorporating them as our process, not just in our community partnerships, but in our actually academic program and strategic planning? Um, and then how are we building reciprocal relationships and honoring community voice? Again, uh, sharing some examples from before, but I also share some more um, calls of things that we can do better in the chapter. And then always having opportunities for co-creation. So I would say the best partnerships we can build are co-created um, from the start and we incorporate them throughout. And so I think that's um, some of the things that I say um, are recommended in the calls for reciprocity and community building. Um, and then I just wanna share this last part. And then one of the um, parts of the chapter at the end, how I kind of close it, there's a closing after this, but I just wanted to share this um, quote from the connection to TIPM and how I connect um, myself back to TIPM. Um, TIPM is a way of processing through the resistance, reverberation and wave jumping that happens when we strive for equity and social justice as it leaves and lives and breathes in indigenous communities. I acknowledge that for both of the stories shared, they are living within the confines of Western Academy and curriculum while being tethered and umbilically connected to tribal nations and communities. And all of this, it affirms the process of moving between back and forth across stages as we move between energy and time. We are rising and moving with the beings who make up the stories and join us on these journeys. TIPM gives us the way of conceptualizing our heart work to understand, broaden and shift the pathways that will impact future generations. So I just wanna acknowledge that, um, I just wanted to share some examples again of things that could be done to indigenize, decolonize, but also just build those relationships with tribal communities that's really important um, as we think about our work and education, but especially higher education and what we can do better and how we can be responsible to future generations, but also acknowledging our ancestors are a part of that co-creation as well. So I want to move to our collective closing. Um, and so I also want to acknowledge um, this part of the, um, the book that we, um, I am, I've been editing a couple of other books um, recently. And so one of the things that we've been doing um, is trying to figure out ways that we can be more collective in our closing process. So when you think about a book, one of the other things I wanted to share that um, I know Anna like maybe indirectly shared, but I just want to name it, that a book is not just the paper, it's also living, right? It's a living form. And so one of the things that we did in a way of, of, con um, of connecting that is having a collective closing. And so last summer, um, we were able to have a collective opportunity to invite all of our contributors to join us and to start thinking about, and we shared out pieces of um, the book with them so that they could read ahead of time if they were able to, and they come together and share in conversation and discussion about what they thought about the TIPM book and what they were able to read, but also their own contributions and their stories. Um, and so there were three areas that came out um, across the conversation, which was acts of decolonization and indigenous reclamation, land recognition and relationships with land and intentional movement towards healing. So I'm gonna share a few quotes because one of the other things that we try to do and our conclusion is trying to make sure everybody at least was mentioned once in their quote um, as we were like reading through everybody's contributions, but also trying to weave it together and braid it together and help it um, hopefully um, make sense to everybody. Um, so under the first one, I'll just share one of the two of the quotes, which is in some ways, this book is an antidote. You know, education was used as a weapon against indigenous children and against us. In some ways, we both flip that script. So now we're weaponizing education, but to strengthen our community. Another uh, contributor said, I call this the anti-trickster level to get to dimension four. But here we are people that have already done that. They are genius. We are genius people and we can do this. Um, and then with the, within the second area around land recognition and relationships with land, it's not how you recognize the land, it's how does the land recognize you? It's transforming that relationship to the land and the water of course, and all of those, all of those beings that we have relations to. 
And the other contributor said, how will our ancestors recognize us in terms of our actions, in terms of our indigeneity? And then also how will future generations recognize us? And then the third is intentional movement towards healing. One of the contributors said, so as we come together, we're doing that Alonshka, the wave jumping, we're doing the Togonga, we're doing the rabbit, we're doing all the ceremonies that we are because we're doing it together. We're teaching each other. And then one of the last quotes I'll share with, with you all from our contributors says, our people have always been wave jumpers. All we have to do is look at the resiliency and strength of our ancestors. And when you think about the future, we also have to bring with us the work that our ancestors laid for us. They didn't just leave us here just for us to have our way. They had intentions for us. So we have to go back and listen to our hearts, listen to our elders. What were those intentions that they wanted us to carry for? And they have intentions for their grandchildren's, grandchildren's grandchildren. So I want to acknowledge that as well. And so um, again, if you are able to purchase the book, um, or download the book and you can see the rest of the quotes in that chapter. I want to acknowledge all of the voices of the contributors to help us co-create the conclusion. And then I also wanted to share um, our collective closing um, and the song that um, Dr. Cornell P. Rorty um, was able to um, compose for us and bring together for us. And if you scan this, you're welcome to scan it now. It will go and um, we also try to be innovative and create a QR code and share that within the book. Um, and so if you go to the QR code and download it, it'll go to a video of Dr. Cornell P.B. Wardy singing the song. And so he gifted us a song to help us close out the book in a good way. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge him for that com composition of this, but also um, that he is always going to be a part of this and it's going to be living even after he goes away or after we all go away, that this will continue to live on. So also um, give a chance to Anna, if you want to add any words to, to, to that. No, I think you captured that well, Robin. And I think we've got um, some time for questions and, and discussion. If, um, I'll maybe turn it back over to the UW team who's hosting us and, and how we can facilitate that. Thank you. Uh, I, just such an honor to be in uh, this project with you all, but to hear the two of you name what you named um, reminds us how it is what you both said, that th this work is living and it is one moment in time. But as uh, Robin just said, and I'm still uh, making sense of, um, it'll be here forever because people like Cornell, people like you two, thank you so much. Um, I'm not yet seeing many questions in the chat. So this is a good moment to uh, come up with questions. Um, and we'll start there. And Dana, I invite you in here as well if you, if you uh, would like to help um, field questions here. Um, hi, everyone. I'll give our audience an opportunity to think of their questions. Um, but I'm glad that you told us a little bit about how you did the collective closing of the book, because that's definitely something that stood out to me. And I think particularly just thinking about this period of time that we've been in, in the past couple of years of, of being able to convene people using this tool of Zoom that we didn't really use a couple of years ago. Um, and I just really appreciate the intentionality of bringing all of the contributors back together and then of um, having that opportunity to have a QR code that really just stood out to me as like, you know, ways to, to make this interactive and to feel like you're a part of this community. Um, so I'm just seeing if there are any questions questions that are coming up one in the from uh, Beatrice here Dana okay. um, Beatrice is wondering Robin and Anna uh, have do you know of places where schools are either starting with this TIPM at the heart or uh, maybe transforming themselves with uh, these ideas there so I can share how UW Tacoma is using it <laughs> um, 
So we have an indigenizing pedagogy institute that non-indigenous faculty can join for um, an academic year. And so we actually started off um, with Dr. Cornell PB Wardy sharing about TIPM as their first engagement and their first day. Um, and so they also don't know this, but they're getting a gift of a book next week um, from TIPM. And so, um, so really just wanting to contextualize that. And so many of those faculty are now incorporating that into their college classes. Um, and so I think that's really amazing how it can live, right? It gets passed on. Um, and so the other thing that I was just going to mention, and we're still figuring this out, but we also are planning to share this out at NIA, um, the National Indian Education Association. We're going to have a pre-conference. So we're reaching out to you, Anthony, and others um, to be a part of that. It'll be a full day uh, pre-conference. We'll be inviting educators across Oklahoma, but other areas who are attending NIA as well um, to be able to see like how learn about it, but then how can they incorporate it into their curriculum. So that's one way that I think we're gonna see it living. Um, but Anna may have some other um, thoughts or suggestions. Yeah, a couple other examples. Um, Dolores Calderon and I have used the framework um, with practicing teachers that are um, doing work to try to implement the STI curriculum. Um, and so we've used it that way. I know that Dr. Veronica Velas, who wrote in the book with us used um, the framework with K-12 ethnic studies um, that she was working in. And then I know Cornell has used it with a number of schools and districts who've asked for different professional development. So um, I think we've all been using it in, in pieces. It sounds like Robin's used it um, intentionally in a kind of a broader scope. And, and I think there's more to come about how the book and the framework can um, go into education systems. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to see lots of questions coming in, so I'll start in order. There, there's an idea that uh, actually Chelsea and I have been thinking a lot about, and I think this came up in our section, but I'd love if Robin or Anna have thoughts about it. Uh, what might it mean for white folks to take up ideas like this, but not to co-opt them or uh, take them as their own without living in, uh, I guess I'm about to answer, living in relationality with indigenous people, but Robin and Anna, um, not to be overly provocative because I brought this up. Do you have advice for us to think about that as we roll these ideas out in uh, mixed spaces? I can start and pass it to you, Robin. I'm, I'm unmuted, so I'll go first. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's an important caution and concern, right? I think about it all the time um, when we start talking about what it means to bring indigenous knowledges into schools and and how people are really excited about that right now, um, but don't necessarily do the deep, the deep thinking and, and relational work that needs to happen for that not to be co-opted. Um, what I would say that I love about, about this book and about the framework is it's not a recipe for, for bringing indigenous knowledges in the classrooms. It's not saying this is what you need to do. It's a framework for development. And to me, um, I think it's a beautiful framework for white teachers who want to think about doing the work in a good way, starting with themselves and, and thinking about how do we scaffold criticality? How do we do this incrementally? Um, and, not, and I don't say that in a way that's like, because I want to intentionally slow the process, but to be respectful of what a process it is um, to, to engage this kind of thinking. And, and I think it's, to me, it's the inspiration that Cornell shares with all of us um, to believe in people um, and to have hope and generosity that people can do good work and have good intentions um, and that they deserve help along the way. And, and that's part of what I take from this framework from that in, in how I've seen Cornell enact it is with so much love and generosity that everybody deserves help to figure out how to be good teachers or how to be good leaders um, and that it takes time and, and what he shares this out as a scaffolded process. Um, and, and so that's what I would say that my hope with, with resisting the co-opting is because it's a framework that's looking at shifting thinking and expanding consciousness with support and with a collective. That's beautiful, Anna. Robin? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I think um, one of the things that um, when we start off sharing this, um, we need to acknowledge that we all are within this space. It's like, it's a living model, right? So we're not always going to be a, 
for, right? We're going to be shifting between depending on that space. And so for those that learn about it, that they can also acknowledge that. And that there's going to be times where we're wave jumping and there's going to be times that we're facing resistance and sometimes we're the resistance, right? And so, um, and so I think that um, that's really important to be able to, to do that. Um, and I think that um, one of the things when I, we were teaching this um, this year, I, before they even had a conversation with Cornell, we had an activity on their identity and teaching. So the, the non-Indigenous faculty like had to first acknowledge what was their identity and how did that impact their teaching and their faculty uh, as a faculty member. And then we moved into learning about TIPM because it was really important. But even before that, we also learned about the Piala, French Piala Club. So contextualizing space and land and where we're at. Um, and so that was something as well, because I think it's really important as we start to build in, like how do we do so and build it in, in a way that's for us and what we're trying to hopefully teach, but also hope that others learn. I want to I, I want to interrupt just before we move on, because Chelsea, I feel like your chapter and what you and Anthony wrote about gets at some of this too, and how you're putting this work in the public schools with teachers. And I wonder if, if you might share a little bit about that. Sure. I, I was just thinking um, we've been doing this work for many, many years. Um, and it just it 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 matches so well with this um, framework. Um, and it starts with with the with the heart of who we are as a school. So really uh, examining those traditional mission and vision, um, but really looking at who are we at QCT, at Colcita Tulalip Elementary? Who are we serving? Whose voices need to be at the table? And instead of sprinkling on indigenous ways of being, we are really trying to center those. And we are in the journey, we are on those waves. And, um, and it's with the strength of our elders and our ancestors that force us to keep going. And I, I, this is my office, behind me are my ancestors, my, my, my strength of who I am, um, both past and present in my life. But you see over my shoulder, that's my grandmother. My grandmother was a survivor of the Tulalip boarding school. She lived her whole life from um, the traumas and the atrocities that were faced in the name of education. If we are not examining everything we do right now, we're continuing that process. We continue to harm our children because not a lot has changed since the time of my grandmother. We still expect our kids to fit in the box. Our kids are still sitting in classrooms taking tests that are not made for them. They're, they're already are designed to fail. But we start every day singing our traditional songs. So that's an example of um, what I call, we are reclaiming indigenous spaces in our, in our school. And while we're talking about indigenous people at this time, this applies to the people you serve. It doesn't matter if you're, whatever you're, the community you're serving, are you centering the people that you're serving? Is your classroom, do your staff reflect the community you're serving? Are their voices centered at the table rather than just sprinkled? Those are the types of questions we have to ask ourselves because otherwise we're, we, we are, um, maintaining the status quo, and we know what the status quo does for um, our indigenous people and our, our brown and black students. It historically does not serve our people. So also with the intention of healing, there's healing that needs to happen in education. So that's all. Thank you. Dana, you want to um... Jump in. Sure. I um, also see a question in our chat about how does this collective work in this book help to reshape your relationship and your connection to Western based institutions? And just to clarify that a little bit more, um, that can be K through 12 schooling systems, universities that we're a part of. Is it worth indigenizing or building our own institutions? I think we have to do both. 
right? Because we can't ever have all of our native children always outside of our tribal schools or in our tribal schools. 70% of our native students are in public schools. And we also have to acknowledge that, right? So while we're developing indigenous focused, tribally focused, I'm, I'm very fortunate that my daughter can go to Chief Lush High, but if she wasn't going to Chief Lush High, she would be going to some other public school where she would be just a number and that they would probably very rarely talk about being native. And so we have to do the work in between both spaces, creating our own systems, but also keeping accountability to those non-dominant, non-indigenous systems as well. Um, and just like I had is um, somebody say, well, our land acknowledgement's even worth it, right? For I know many people have that performative um, you know, perspective and I really, I understand that, but I also have heard from a survey out to native students at our institution that a land acknowledgement helped them feel visible. It helped them feel seen. And if I could have one native student feel seen, it's worth me repeating that land acknowledgement every single class because they don't always feel seen in their classes. And so I really think it's important for us to acknowledge like also like we also want to call criticality, but we also want to continue to make sure we're building those skilling spaces for our students as well. Yeah, I would echo what Robin's saying. I, I see Filiberto with that with that question in the chat. Thank you, Philly. Um, I, I expect that that you have thoughts about this. Um, Filiberto and I work closely together, and, and I'm thinking of your question, Filiberto, um, with work that he and I do closely with, with Megan Bang, with Indigenous STEAM Collective. Um, and to me, it's exactly what Robin said, and I might not always want to do both. Um, there's lots of days where I'm so thankful um, to be a part of ISTEAM and have, have work to do with, with my own community, with other tribal communities where we're not confined by Western systems and, and we're not living in, in the colonial fog that, that Chelsea's reminding us of, and, and it's beautiful. Um, and there's times where I'd like to just do that all the time and, and not deal with, with Western schools. Um, but to me, it's exactly what Robin says that we have a responsibility to that because that's where our kids are every day. Um, and work I do in early learning, I mean, our, our babies and toddlers are, spend most of their waking hours in childcare centers, um, so many of them. And, and because of that, I think that's why those of us on this call have a lot of different projects that, that we engage and that we're responsible towards because um, it's about dreaming, it's about building the future that we want and, and our own spaces and about the experiences of our kids every day and the responsibility that we have to them right now. That's what I think this framework is also so brilliant that, that Cornell has done because it, it gives us something to hold on to and how we do that work um, in a bit of a structure to, to support those efforts um, when they can really be overwhelming. Well, it's 6.03 and as someone who's not very good at time, I'm gonna seize the moment to wrap us up and pass to Anne. I think the, be the beautiful thing is, uh, Folks, we have lots of questions unanswered in the chat and that's part of this work. So we appreciate you putting um, your ideas in there as we move to Spotlight Anne. I wanna again, thank uh, Robin and Anna and uh, I'm excited for what happens next. So um, Professor Ishimaru. Thank you so much to all of you. So much beauty and power here. I wanted to make sure that people had the link so that you could purchase the book. There's actually a discount. Uh, that you can get. So take advantage of that there. You can uh, get that uh, QR code. Uh, we'll also post it um, uh, in, or we'll also put the link in the chat in case uh, you're not able to grab it. Uh, two other quick things. The next time, as Dr. Craig said, there's going to be an opportunity to actually dig into these questions. Um, they're going to be hosting uh, the roundtable so that we can continue the conversation. Um, and you can, uh, you will automatically um, be. Uh, invited and have an uh, opportunity to um, be part of that if you registered already, but you can also share that with others who might want to be registered for the round table that it's gonna be June 6th uh, coming up. And then lastly, we have um, a survey that uh, we would love to invite you to participate in so that we can hear what's, what's worked, uh, what we could do better, uh, what other things we might support. Um, and so if you complete the survey, you get a chance to, um, 
uh, enter a raffle and win a copy of a choice of one of the three books from our series this, um, this year. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and thank you to the folks who shared their beautiful work with us. Have a good evening. <laughs>